Hi, everyone. Welcome to our webinar on user management in ClickHouse databases. We're calling it the unabridged edition because in this presentation, we'll be shooting for a happy medium between things that are too basic and complete confusion. There's a very rich model for user management in ClickHouse, and we'll try to give you a tour of the major parts of it so that you can see the whole picture. With that, let's get going. So some quick introductions. So once again, uh, I'm Robert. I uh, have been working with databases with, really it's over 40 years, uh, starting with pre-relational databases and working on ClickHouse for about six. Uh, I have with me, uh, as I mentioned before, Alexander Zaitsev. He is a founder of Altinity, uh, CTO, and has been working on uh, making large systems work and on ClickHouse uh, since 2017. He's also the designer of our uh, the, the architect of our Altinity.cloud. And speaking of Altinity.cloud, uh, we are a full, a complete service and, and software provider for ClickHouse. We wrote the Altinity Kubernetes, Kubernetes operator, which some of you on this call are probably using uh, to run uh, ClickHouse in Kubernetes. We have Altinity stable builds, which are uh, our own builds of ClickHouse. They're open source, but offer three years of maintenance. And we do a bunch of other open source uh, uh, projects, including many, many contributions to ClickHouse itself. All right, let's um, <clears throat> let's jump in. So, uh, just a level set very quickly for anybody who has not heard uh, ClickHouse uh, or heard of ClickHouse. It's a real-time analytic database. What that means is it gives you very quick responses on data sets that can be very large and also where the data is arriving very very quickly, often millions of rows per seconds. So if we look at ClickHouse, sometimes I like to explain it as the love child of MySQL, which is a very popular uh, open source database. It runs practically anywhere. Uh, it has an open source license in this case. Uh, in the case of MySQL, it's GPL. Uh, in the case of ClickHouse, it's, it's Apache 2.0. And uh, of course, it understands SQL. From the, uh, you know, from the uh, analytical side of the house, we have features uh, that include a shared nothing architecture, so the ability to, uh, to deploy a bunch of of nodes that have their own storage or access to shared storage in some cases. Uh, the data itself is stored in columns with very very high rates of com uh, uh, compression, and ClickHouse is extremely good at parallelizing the scans of the data. And uh, that's a completely different topic, but it, it results in almost miraculously fast uh, uh, performance in uh, you know, across these large data, data sets. So as a result, it's become extremely popular. It has about over 30,000 stars on GitHub. Hundreds of people offer, um, uh, uh, make, uh, you know, our uh, submit PRs each year to improve ClickHouse. So that's ClickHouse. Let's just jump in and at the beginning of this review of, of user management, let's just pretend that, that that we're developers. And what we want is some quick self-defense about how user management works, the kind of things that you'd wanna know the first time that you're bringing up ClickHouse and say on your laptop, and you just need to get some work done. So let's dive in and, and figure it out. So when you first install ClickHouse on a Linux machine, you can just run ClickHouse client like this slide shows, and what it's going to do is connect you to ClickHouse. So what happened there? Well, actually, what you're doing is you're using the default user. And it's literally called default, So, and it has no password. So uh, this means that any newly installed uh, 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 developer version of ClickHouse is going to basically be unprotected. And it doesn't have any additional users. So I. Uh, so everything else, protecting this uh, this user as well as uh, making users appropriate for our application, that's something that we have to do ourselves. Fortunately, it's pretty easy to do. So it used to be, if you if you in fact if you've used ClickHouse for a while, you know that it used to be that you would have to make a little XML file and stick it in um, Etsy ClickHouse server users.d to define your new user. And this is an example of how that XML format works. So there's the, if you're familiar with the XML configuration files in general, they always begin with the ClickHouse tag. Then there's a section called users. 
And then you the tags that follow that are the names of actual users. In this case, an account or a login call XML user. And we can see that there are various uh, settings here. Uh, some important ones that I want to highlight. Access management says that this uh, this user can issue what are called RBAC commands. Um, we uh, have a network mask to restrict it to uh, localhost. Uh, we have a SHA-256 uh, uh, encrypted password, uh, which is basically going to be the thing that ClickHouse compares against when we when we try to log in. And then we have these things called profiles and quotas. We'll talk about those uh, in more detail later. But you basically take this file, you put it inside uh, inside the users.d directory, and bang, uh, as soon as ClickHouse notices it, which is usually within a few seconds, you've got a new account. So uh, one kind of confusing thing that people run into if they're using this approach is how to get the passwords generated. And fortunately, <clears throat> they, if you look inside the example users.xml file, which we'll talk about in a second, it gives you this command, which is shown here. So it's kind of this gnarly command. It, it basically creates a random password for you and then runs it through a SHA-256 sum. And this second value is the thing that actually gets stored in that XML file. So you have to use these exact uh, commands, otherwise, uh, otherwise it'll it'll mess up. So this is a little bit confusing and kind of painful. And in fact, there's a better way to do it. And that better way is the following: uh, using a create user command. Most databases, as you're probably familiar, have uh, 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 support create uh, create user. This is a SQL command that that generates a new login. And this is a simple example of a user that is identified by the password top secret. Um, and ClickHouse will take care of doing the SHA-256 hash for you. Um, and then it's restricted to the local host and it's using a settings profile called default, which is one that comes baked into ClickHouse. This is an example of what we call role-based access control. So I'll use this term RBAC. And really what it means in the context of ClickHouse is when we say RBAC, uh, ClickHouse RBAC commands, we mean SQL commands to create and manage users. So this is much easier. And it used to be that you actually had to, uh, that the, in older versions of ClickHouse, you would actually have to create a user that could issue these commands. That's no longer necessary. Uh, when, you, when you bring your ClickHouse up the first time, these commands just work out of the box from the default uh, account. So this is a good time to talk about where those user definitions are stored. I've already mentioned that XML users are stored in the users.d directory. So these are out on the file system. And they're the default user, as well as the default profile and the default quota, talk about that in a minute, are stored in a file called users.xml. So generally speaking, you don't want to change that file because it gets overwritten in new releases. When you create users or other types of, of entities like quotas and profiles, you create little files and stick them under users.d. The config.xml file is important because it has a number of settings that tell ClickHouse, for example, where to find the user definitions, as well as set things like uh, uh, standards for defining passwords. We'll uh, show examples of that later on. The other place that ClickHouse by default stores users is in this uh, library here, varlib ClickHouse access. And when you do a SQL RBAC command like that create user I just showed you, it will stick a file over in um, under the access directory, which has this long UUID uh, uh, as part of the name. And if you go look inside that file, it'll actually be the definition of your user. So. Um, or, or actually, you have to, it's a little bit more complicated than that. Uh, but basically, this is, it has an internal organization. And in general, unless something is broken, you never need to mess with it. But you need to be aware that these things are on the file system and, uh, and for example, need to be protected properly from, uh, from outside users. So that's uh, the scheme for storing uh, ClickHouse users. Let's look at a couple other things. Um, one really important feature of uh, of all ClickHouse uh, users is much like Postgres and other databases, they have what are called network masks, which are designed to say, hey, people, only people coming from certain hosts uh, or through certain network interfaces are allowed to access this account. So I'm just going to give examples in, um, 
using RBAC commands. Uh, but the same thing, you can do these same things in the, the XML uh, definitions of users. So for example, uh, this first command just says, hey, this user I'm creating, uh, you can log in from any IP address uh, anywhere uh, and we'll, we'll accept it. Um, this next one says, hey, I can I'm only going to allow accounts that come in and the TCP IP traffic has uh, is coming from localhost. And then the final one is restricting it to a, using a CIDR uh, uh, address that, that restricts it to a particular network. There are also the possibility of using regex uh, expressions on the host name. All of these are documented in the user um, uh, user.xml. So you can go look and see, uh, see where they are um, for XML users or for RBAC users, there's also abundant document uh, documentation in the ClickHouse docs. I bring this up right now is because as a developer, one of the first problems you may run into is that you will, uh, you know, sort of get this wrong somehow, and then ClickHouse will say, "Hey, your password." It'll basically give you kind of a a, a somewhat vanilla message that just says, "Hey, your authentication failed," and so. This this network mask is a common way that people run into problems, especially if you um, you know are doing things like port forwarding and Kubernetes, other things where uh, where things get tweaked. <clears throat> so, a question here, which I'll take uh, right uh, live, is a great opportunity. Can you change the host uh, IP with alter user later on? Yes, absolutely. One of the great things about one of the really nice things about this create user is you can go ahead and alter this stuff uh, at, at any time. So, uh, so yes, uh, that's definitely possible, and and in fact, uh, RBAC enables that. What about profile settings? Uh, well, you can ClickHouse comes with a couple of default profiles, but uh, they don't have anything in them. Profiles are really important because they are where you can set values that will be your your default settings when you're running commands in SQL. So for example, this is a, a settings profile that says, we're gonna log all queries. So every time you execute a query with a user that uses this profile, it's gonna go into the query log. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Every time you execute a, a query, it's gonna run final. Um, uh, you don't have the equivalent of having um, final, which is a keyword that forces ClickHouse to ensure data are fully merged. It's really important when you're dealing with things like, uh, for example, like replicated merge tree and so on and so forth. So when you have things that you want to, uh, you know, sort of settings that you want to apply to users, the profile setting is where you do it. It's a very powerful mechanism. And this is an example of creating a user with a particular profile. So there's one final thing that you want you need to understand really from the beginning, which is how to create users on clusters. So the commands that I've shown you only apply to the host that they're running on, although there's there's a way that you can make them work over the cluster. We'll show you that in a minute. But in a in a vanilla clickhouse installation that comes out of the box, if you've set up a cluster and you want commands to to run over that cluster so that the users get set up on all servers, you have to use this on cluster keyword. And what this syntax shows in every single RBAC command, uh, just like you know all DDL commands in ClickHouse support this, um, every, every single RBAC command also supports this, although sometimes you have to go look at the documentation to get it in the right spot. Um, it, this is saying, hey, execute this command on the cluster that is defined by this macro. So this is a macro and what this is gonna do is it's gonna read the actual value for the cluster out of uh, the macro values, which are uh, defined in macros.xml. This is something that if you're running on Kubernetes with the alternative operator, this, this value is set for you automatically. If you're running it yourself, you need to, you need to set this up. Uh, and, and basically this, this command will then work regardless of what the cluster name is. So those are the final, you know, sort of the basic things that you need to know for for self defense when you're when you're sort of bringing up Cl uh, uh, ClickHouse for the first time and uh, starting development. Let's go ahead and uh, look a little bit more closely at what's going on. So we're going to dig into the RBAC model, and uh, let's start with a picture, sort of an entity relationship diagram. So. If we look at this diagram, 
what we see is that there are these different entities that I've been talking about and also a new one called a role. So we have users, which you can, which uh, we've shown how to create. Users as also, as we uh, partially shown at least, can have an associated quota, which is going to provide limits for that particular user so that it can't hog all the resources in the system and settings, which are values that will appear as uh, that will be applied when we do queries, either system settings or settings for merge tree tables. And so these are associated to the user. And they're in the RBAC model, we have what are called privileges. So for example, grant, you can say grant select. I'll show you an example of this in a second. And that will say, hey, this user can can select data off a particular, off all tables out of a da uh, tables in a particular database or uh, 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 just a single table. Now, having to give those individually to every user is really inconvenient because you might have hundreds of users. So as a result, uh, SQL for many, many years has had what are called roles. And this is where the, this is the R in, in RBAC. And uh, what that does is it basically allows you to create a template for that has privileges associated with it, has a settings pro, uh, profile uh, uh, associated with it and a quota. And then you can grant that to particular users and they will, um, it, it'll be applied to them as if it had been granted directly. So this is the basic model. Let's look how it works using a very simple example. <clears throat> so here's, let's start out by, we're basically going to, to work through the example to make it understandable. We're kind of going to work from left to right on this, uh, ending up with a user that has its uh, a profile set quota and some and some useful privileges. So let's start with the settings profile. Here's a simple example. So uh, we're going to limit the the number of max threads. Uh, it's going to default to two. It can be set as low as one. It can be set as high as four. And we're going to put a memory uh, usage limit. You of course can put. There's there's a wide variety of of interesting uh, properties that you can set. Oh, and this is going to be a read only user as well. They can't do any. Um, they can't do any updates. And then what we'll do is we'll create a role which uses that which uses that profile. So it's going to be called U2 role. And so this role doesn't do anything, but it has this profile associated with it. And now we can begin to give it some privileges. So let's do that. So the standard way that you do this is you'll you'll start with a command like the following revoke all from U2 role. They don't actually come with any, so that's usually pretty safe to, but but this is just good hygiene to make sure that there's nothing somehow gotten in there that that you don't expect and then what we're going to do is allow this user to see the tables in the system database directory or system database and also do the selects on on system tables in uh, the uh, system and default uh, databases this user if you have a database called foo this user won't be able to see it and they won't be able to select off the tables there so this is a really simple um i this this is a really simple um, example. Of course, uh, you much you might build up you know like much more complex grants and uh, but but this uh, shows shows basically how they work. Now, <clears throat> so the role has some privileges. Let's actually put a quota on that role as well because we want to make sure that this role isn't a hog. And uh, for example, we want to limit it to uh, uh, we want to actually limit it uh, to five queries. So in 30 second interval, they can only uh, run five queries. If they run more than five queries, they'll basically get an error message and the, the maximum amount, of, and they're limited to the maximum amount of rows that they can bring back. So quotas are very versatile. And as this uh, thing over on the right shows, you can set them for all these types of, uh, of resource limits that are shown here, and they, they apply over a given period of time. So uh, there's lots of examples of these in the documentation. Just play around with it. It's quite it's quite flexible. And in fact, the way that people tend to use it, and is that you'll have a role associated with a particular type of task inside ClickHouse. So, for example, you may have a role that has uh, that, that's assigned to users that are used for inserting data, and so that would that role would be associated with a quota, uh, which is appropriate for inserts, and keeps them from just at taking all the resources in the system. Um, so the final thing to do is create a user. So roles are not, are not, are, 
you know, when you actually log into the system, you have to have a a user and the user is actually the thing that gets authenticated. The role is really just a template for giving you, uh, and you can have multiple roles, but for giving, for granting you privileges and associating you with quotas and uh, uh, and profile, uh, profile values. So that's it. Now, I think this, ah, yeah. So one of the things I'm not gonna go into detail here because it, it will, become, it will make you completely, it will make us completely crazy is you can change these things. So for example, users, if you want to change their password, you can do an, instead of doing create user, you can do alter user and give them a new password. You, uh, you know, can, can set their default role. Uh, so most of the entities or many of the entities, uh, for example, I, uh, well, particularly users have the notion of alter, but not all of them. So for example, um, when you're creating a quota, there isn't really a notion of altering a quota. You create a new one that has the values that you want. So check the documentation and try it out. This is something where the behavior sometimes is a little bit surprising. Now, the RBAC model that I showed you at the beginning of this section had these, had roles, uh, quotas, uh, profiles, and users. Uh, and of course they get assigned, uh, which of course get assigned privileges. But there's also another really interesting feature called row policies. And these are very important for user management in large systems, particularly in cases where you have many users, for example, for different groups, and you, you wanna give them differing levels of access to data. So here's a, a, a completely synthetic example where what we're doing is we have a table and it has a column called group and it has a column called name, and there's some rules that we want to associate with them. So for example, that user RP user two can only see the rows where group is less than, than three. And you can imagine this group might, might correspond to something related to the business, like what, what group you have or what level of privileges uh, you're granting this person. So how do we implement that? Because we have a single table. We don't want to have different tables for everybody and they're overlapping sets that they can, they can look at. And that's what row policies do. So in this example, let's create a few, let's create a few users, zero, one, and two. And then what we're going to do is give them use row policies on um, that table, which uh, which give differing levels of permission. So for example, uh, <clears throat> and just to pick one, you can see that the um, row the uh, uh, RP user two, sorry, just found it, can see every can see every row where the group number is less than three. So what does that look like when you actually run it? So you log in as this user, and then when you do a select, they simply see the data that uh, where the group number is one and two. This is super flexible and could be combined uh, to, you know, you can have multiple row policies that apply to users. So for example, here, I've set a row policy which just applies to everybody, which means that if you don't hear anything else, you can only see rows where group is equal to one. And these are and it has this permissive tag, which means, hey, if there are other row policies that let you see more, great, we'll let you see that as well. So this, you can see how you can begin to combine this. Of course, you can make yourself completely confused. Now, one important thing about row policies is these policies are very specific to single tables and single users. So one of the things that you can do is you can use wildcards to assign these uh, policies to, uh, 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 you know, to, to groups of tables or even, um, uh, uh, you know, within a database. And this will allow you to, to create a more template oriented, uh, a, a, you know, a more template, uh, template oriented system. Okay, that's row policies. Uh, there actually is some interesting, there are some interesting feature requests on this that will make it even more flexible, but I think that's enough. You get the idea. You, you can play around with this and put whatever rules you want. Um, let's talk about XML. Uh, so uh, sometimes when you talk to DBAs, they will, or particularly people who've used databases for a long time, they'll just say role-based access control is the only way to do things. Well, that's not entirely true, perhaps, especially if you're a developer. So let's have a let's have a quick look at this. Um, so we had that RBAC model. When you go back to uh, XML users, um, and say, hey, what's the model there? Well, the big difference is it doesn't have roles. So roles are very powerful because they allow you to combine all of these privileges sort of in a template, uh, in a in a template uh, 
like way uh, to groups of users. So that's the, so roles are super good for that. It just doesn't exist in XML. What you have users, you have quotas, you have uh, settings profiles, but you can grant privileges directly to the users. Uh, this is actually not so bad in some cases. Let me show you an example. So uh, <clears throat> this is the XML user. And here's a couple things that we can do. First, we can do explicit grants. And so it uses the same grant syntax that you can read in the, um, uh, that, you, that you can read about in the, in the ClickHouse docs, uh, but you just don't include the name of the person you're granting to. It will be granted to this user. And this is saying, hey, we can, we can select off any of the tables. Here's another kind of cool feature. This is databases tag. And it basically allows you to put filters in, which uh, which are basically like row policies. So um, so you can get you know get close to what you uh, you know what you want to what you can achieve with the full the, the full SQL based um, uh, RBAC commands. It's interesting to ask why you know this is a you know a less powerful model. Why would you still use it? Well. Uh, for that, we have this table to kind of look at the trade-offs between these two different approaches. So clearly, as, as we're showing in these last two slides, XML-based users are just, it's a less rich model. Uh, RBAC can do anything you can do that involves security or, or user management, it's gonna be an RBAC. So there's just, there's literally, literally hundreds of privileges that, that you have inside uh, ClickHouse. You can, or, you know, you can assign them to roles. Uh, you can build, for example, a model that supports full separation of tenants in the same database. It's very, it's very, very flexible. Uh, so XML just doesn't do that. If, uh, you know, if, if that's what you're looking for, you're going to need to use RBAC. On the other hand, what's great about XML is that if you are just deploying something using infrastructure as code, because the XML users are file based, and you just want, if you just want ClickHouse to pop up with known users, XML users are good for this because uh, they'll fit into you know, you know, sort of your development pipelines. Um, it's just harder to integrate RBAC. As far as the ease of deployment, it's kind of a wash here. Uh, XML, obviously, you're going to have to touch, uh, you're going to have to touch the file system somehow. Anything from Ansible to, you know, uh, using mounts in, in Kubernetes with config maps, uh, you know, you're going to have to bake that in. Whereas for RBAC, you can obviously just do it over, uh, you can just do it over the network. And then finally, and this is a really important point, XML has no cluster support. It's all local to the to the, uh, to the server and the file system where you put the files, whereas the RBAC model can, uh, can uh, create uh, users, profiles, things like that across the entire cluster. So let's look at that next. And that's the topic, managing users and clusters. So, <clears throat> ClickHouse has, as we showed you a little bit uh, a little bit earlier, has this on cluster command. And once again, this is a keyword, and you can see it used, um, you know, sort of throughout this, uh, uh, you know, throughout this example. And once again, the cluster is a macro that that name in the in the squiggly brackets is a name that gets filled from whatever value is uh, was set in uh, in macros dot in in the macros. Uh, a keyword in config.xml, you can also see it in the system.macros table. So, so if you're working with by default and you, if you don't uh, you know, change things, you're gonna need to use this on cluster command for every single command that you, uh, uh, that you uh, uh, execute. Here's another thing. Uh, if a new replica comes up, uh, for example, and you're you're managing the cluster yourself, you're going to have to run all these commands again every time you you add a replica or add a shard to the system. And you'll note that we say create role if not exists. These are basically this is an item potent command. So that role, uh, this command can be run on every node in the cluster. And if the role is already there, great, it skips it. But if it's not there, it's going to create it. So this is a little bit painful. And in fact, there's a better way to handle this. So, and that is to actually keep the RBAC definitions in Keeper or Zookeeper as the, as the case may be. So you still have your XML users, but what you can define is uh, what we call a user directory inside Keeper. And so if you come in uh, and we'll, uh, you'll see this in a second, there's gonna be a path inside Keeper and 
my cluster under this this my cluster node, you're going to start to see the RBAC definitions. How do we get this set up? Well, this is where you go into config.xml and you basically put this tag in that says replicated. And, and then you have this zookeeper path which says, hey, go stick these things in, um, you know, in this place. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, so this will, uh, this means that whenever you execute a create user command, you no longer have to put the on cluster uh, in it. And, uh, and, and, and when new replicas and new shards uh, show up, they will automatically get all the RBAC commands re replicated to them. So here you go. So these are the simpler commands. And basically, if you're running a cluster, this is definitely, uh, you know, in most cases, this is a perf now the preferred way to do it. We use this in Altinity.cloud. It's using the Ivan Cloud. In fact, uh, uh, the Ivan folks are the ones who who put this in. It's a great feature and and one that everybody should know. Um, <clears throat> of course, clusters are are many splendid things, and there's a bunch of other ways that uh, that you can control users. I'm just going to mention three that you may want to look at, uh, depending on your uh, depending on your needs. Uh, if you need truly centralized management of users and roles, that can be handled through LDAP. So there's a couple of different ways that it can be configured. It can simply uh, be used for authentication and give you access to uh, uh, to users. Um, or, or just uh, validate the passwords for particular users, but you can also have it serve as a full user directory where users and roles are defined, and then they get mapped to actual roles, for example, in uh, in your ClickHouse servers. So this is this is super useful, um, and there are many people that use it. In fact, um, this is what you would use if you wanted to connect, for example, to Microsoft Active Directory, because it has LDAP interfaces, and you can configure uh, uh, ClickHouse to connect with it and uh, and resolve uh, users and, and roles that way. Another thing that you may be interested in is, again, at the, at the authentication level, is rather than using passwords, you can use authentication with certificates. So ClickHouse supports MTLS, so um, the uh, basically mutual uh, TLS between client and server. So it's supported at the uh, at the, the, the network transport layer uh, to make sure that, for example, a certificate that shows up is signed by a a, a CA that the server that the server uh, recognizes. And it allows you to associate a specific certificate with a specific client. So that client has to present. So you, so you actually have full authentication and you know who you're dealing with because they have to present a unique certificate that is um, uh, that 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 authenticates them. So so that's available. There's documentation for that. Um, and finally, there's Kerberos, which is something that that we implemented. In fact, Altinity implemented both LDAP and Kerberos. And you can use uh, Kerberos for authentication. This is not as widely used, uh, but but it's there and available if you need it. So um, let's switch gears a little bit. We are talking about clusters and distributed systems. So this is kind of a good time to also think about Kubernetes. So if you're using Kubernetes and and you're running ClickHouse, there's a pretty good chance that you're using the Altinity operator, which as the name sounds, as the name implies, was something that we wrote and, and maintain. The way that if you haven't used it, here's just a quick level set. The way that Kubernetes works is Kubernetes is, is a system to manage container-based applications. And the applications are defined through resources. Um, and what the operator, what the click, what the Altinity operator does is it defines what's called a ClickHouse installation resource. And so when you want to create a cluster, you will have a little YAML file. Well, sometimes a slightly bigger YAML file, but it contains the definition of the cluster that you would like to see. And you submit that to Kubernetes. Kubernetes says, oh, I see you've got a ClickHouse installation resource. It hands it to the Altinity ClickHouse operator. It looks at it. And then it goes out and looks at the resources that are deployed in Kubernetes. And if they aren't there, it creates new ones. And, and then Kubernetes takes care of, of, of scheduling everything. And your cluster comes up and runs. So that's how this works, This that this process of 
is this is a, a process of re reconciliation where you have a desired state of the system and then you make the real system look like it. So these YAML files for, uh, for ClickHouse installations also have a notion of users. They can also do profiles um, and quotas. So here's an example of a, an XML user that's just defined directly in the configuration. So this is YAML, but if you look at this, you can see how this would actually map directly to a uh, XML tags. And that, in fact, is exactly what the operator does. It looks at this and it says, OK, you're going to need a user, so I'm going to generate an XML user tag, and then I'm going to give these have these additional tags under it, so that this user has uh, the correct network mask, has a uh, you know has a, a SHA-256 and, and encrypted pa or a hashed password, and so on and so forth. And what will happen is when your cluster comes up, that user will be there. Now, uh, Kubernetes is a little bit uh, has some additional uh, features above and beyond this. One of the things you don't like to do. Uh, in distributed systems, is has something like this hash, uh, this this hash here, be passed around in networks for everybody to see. So, uh, Kubernetes has what are called secrets. So, secrets are another resource type, which allow you to pass values like these hashed, um, th these hashes for um, uh, that represent passwords to to get them into applications in a secure way. And uh, so, you create the resource and you have the actual uh, password, and then the operator, the alternative operator has specialized syntax that is actually imitates the normal syntax that Kubernetes uses for handle handle click, uh, passwords. And as you can see, a lot quicker than I can explain it, uh, the password is just pulled from this secret. You have a secret resource of a particular name, and you're looking for a key in it, and whatever value you find, you just stick it in. So that allows you to, uh, to manage this and is a best practice for uh, for man managing uh, uh, users inside Kubernetes. Um, another thing that see the, these ClickHouse uh, installation resources can do is you can put raw, raw XML files in there. So if there is something where, for example, you want to set up a profile and you just you know want to do it, uh, you know you know stick your uh, actually this is uh, the username is a little bit misleading here. It should be my profiles, um, but the uh, you can set up a this is setting up a profile object with you know setting max threads and and uh, saying that you want to log queries. So you can stick this in and again uh, the the operator will uh, generate these files, put them out on the file system, and everything when you log in you'll find that everything just works. So we've talked about the general model. What I want to end with here is because we're 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 coming up on. Uh, toward the end, I want to just talk about some different tricks for management that you may want to, that that you may find useful. First thing is what the heck's going on down there? So for this, ClickHouse has system tables. If you use ClickHouse, you know that the system tables are great, and there are a bunch of system tables that are re that are relevant to user management. So there are system tables for all the entities that uh, that we've described here, users, roles, quotas, uh, uh, profiles, settings, profiles, as they're called. And um, and you can see, for example, this this red, uh, uh, this, uh, this little red spot here refers to the fact that you can see the effects of your settings in the profile by going and looking in system.settings. And if if the profile has changed it, it will be marked as uh, the, this this where change uh, uh, is is going to you know to pull up settings that have actually been uh, modified. So there's uh, just a bunch of things that you can you can do with this to find out what's going on in the system and make sure that what you specified, for example, in your RBAC commands, is what really happened. Second thing to look at is a show statement. So you can say show users, and that will, assuming you have the privilege to do so, it will show you all the users, show quotas, so on and so forth. These are super useful to see what's defined on the system. So this is something that you'll want to get very friendly with uh, as, you're, as you're building up these systems and, uh, and debugging problems or making sure they're working correctly. Second thing. Password complexity rules. So these are a relatively new addition in uh, ClickHouse. Well, uh, it's in the last couple of years, uh, but they allow um, you to specify rules for uh, 
uh, for passwords. So for example, it, we can allow in this particular case, uh, you can have accounts that don't have a password. That's not something you normally want to do in a production system. You almost, uh, there, there's no real reason to have, uh, uh, not to have an account, uh, particularly for anything that could be accessed off the network. Uh, but this will, uh, you can enforce these, and these are general rules. They're global to the entire server, and they're set in config.xml. And then um, there are password complexity rules. We actually use these in um, things like alternity.cloud. Uh, they are pretty handy because they allow you to set rules. Uh, you know, so if your corporate IT says, hey, passwords have to be, uh, you know, 12 characters long, uh, there's a rule for that. And these are uh, disabled by default but you can turn them on again. They're set in config.xml and uh, you can use these to, uh, to control the passwords. If the passwords don't meet these, they, the account, uh, the logins won't work. And then there's uh, just a bunch of access control settings. Uh, you know, so for example, that uh, users without row policies can read rows. This is, I'm just picking one at random here. Row policies have this interesting uh, uh, property that that like you have to decide what to do if if there are row policies on a table but a user shows up that doesn't have any row policies assigned to them in this case they'll still be able to read rows so you want to look at this is that's actually an important setting uh, for row policies because it what it does is effectively creates a loophole that anybody where you forget to give them a row policy can see everything so uh, that's and and so these settings are designed to uh, to control things like that, you can look at them and uh, set them accordingly. All right, so this has been kind of a lightning tour of uh, of user management. I'm glad to see we have extra time and we've had a bunch of questions and we can certainly take more. Let me just give you uh, kind of some summary uh, things that you can do to, you know, takeaways. So um, RBAC. So we talked a lot about that model. It's very rich and it's it's uh, it's a DBA friendly model. People who are accustomed to working in SQL and SQL scripts and have mechanisms to apply them. And it works over the network on uh, on clusters. So um, that's something you definitely, if you're man managing large systems and with a lot of people accessing the system, it's definitely the way to go. Uh, if you're just bringing up default users and uh, de you know deploying a ClickHouse, uh, for example, using infrastructures, code xml files are a very developer friendly way to bring up a cluster uh, a clickhouse cluster that has uh, default users uh, already configured and and ready to roll this uh, idea of using replicated user directories and clusters it's a great great feature unfortunately it's not well documented uh, it is uh, our intention to uh, change that in the uh, in the very near future uh, with a nice blog article. It was put in by the Ivan folks. And in fact, the best documentation for this feature is still the pull request uh, where it was implemented. Uh, we'll try and cure that as quickly as possible with a nice blog. Um, Kubernetes developments can use either way. It can go either way. They can use XML uh, users. They can also use RBAC commands. You take your pick. And then the alternative operator has a number of uh, features that uh, are specific to Kubernetes and allow you to tap into the security mechanisms there. I think the final thing, and this is something that that as you get into to using this, it, the 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 model is not completely consistent. As you can see, like the difference between XML and RBAC, the different features um, uh, th that you have with uh, uh, you know with LDAP versus uh, versus XML versus RBAC. They're not all totally consistent, but a really key thing is it's not fully documented. So sometimes you have to go and like, the first thing you should do is, is go look at config.xml and config and, and users.xml. They have great, great comments. Um, so they, uh, uh, you know, these are things that are really, uh, you know, really important to, to do. Um, and, you know, you can ask people, I. I talked about community lore here. One of the things I sometimes do if I'm desperate is I, you know, if you use ClickHouse and you're operating open, open source, it's really important to have a copy of the ClickHouse code somewhere. And what you can do when you want to see, hey, how do quotas work and what are all the different ways you can use them, go look at the tests. The tests have are 
readable text files that show different examples of working commands for quotas. You have to search for them. Uh, I think it's uh, stateless test 001297 has, uh, has quotas. You go in there and you'll see examples. And so if you can't find a code example anywhere else, that's the place to look. Um, what if you find something missing? Well, give us a call. So we actually, as I've alluded to in this presentation, uh, you know, we did a fair amount of the of the implementation here, and uh, so so for example, LDAP support, Kerberos, row policy templates, these and other things are things that Altenity uh, implemented. We would happily put stuff in. Um, you know, if you have if you need to evolve the security model in different ways. Um, and of course, uh, as we're doing here, we're happy to explain how it works. Uh, often when you have a question or you think something is missing, there's just a different way to do it in ClickHouse from what you think. Really important, if you find gaps here, there are bugs in this. So for example, if you use a merge table, it ignores uh, it ignore, ignores road policies. That's not good. We know about that bug and uh, we're working on it. The, uh, if you do find security bugs, uh, email them to either of these and tell somebody. Um, so this is, I, uh, I, uh, you can send them to us or you can send them directly to ClickHouse. It's really, really important to, to log this stuff so that we don't have holes. Um, so, uh, final thing, just more information. I won't, uh, I. Uh, Go too far in this, but there's lots of documentation there. I said it's not consistent, you know, it's not consistently documented, so you have to sometimes look in multiple places. But the information is there, um, particularly for Kubernetes. If you're, you know, if you're using that, the Altenity Kubernetes operator has a hardening guide which talks about many of these topics specifically for uh, Kubernetes. And um, there will be uh, samples for this talk. Uh, all the code that you or most of the code you uh, you saw here, like the RBAC commands, were taken from worked examples that are actually out in a GitHub repo. It's located here. Uh, those will be checked in in a few minutes. So with that, uh, thank you very much. I would just like to conclude by saying, hey, you know, if you need to run ClickHouse in the cloud, we do that. You need to run it on-prem. We support that. Uh, you want to run in Kubernetes. Uh, Alternative Kubernetes operator is probably something you're already using. And we do builds for ClickHouse, which have a three-year maintenance uh, cycle. So feel free, if any of those things are interesting, feel free to join our Slack, come to our website, contact us, or just go and use them. It's open source. Uh, so uh, grab them, build systems. If you like what you see, tell your friends. And one final pitch, uh, we are running a conference on open source analytics. It's happening in November. It's virtual. It is free. Uh, we have... Uh, something like we had 110 talk proposals. We've winnowed them down to about 40. So there's just a bunch of stuff about every aspect of open source analytics. Uh, come to osacon.io and register for the con uh, conference. We'd love to see you there. So with that, I think we are done. Just for folks who join late, uh, this has been recorded. So everything that we've discussed, you'll get in. A, you'll get a link to the recording. You will get a link to the slides. And uh, if you have any further questions, yeah, come to the Slack um, and uh, and contact us. And we'll stick around for a minute. If there are further questions, we're happy to answer them. Um, Alexander, are there any that you'd like to highlight from the list that came up that you think are could use uh, uh, further discussion? Uh, first of all, very good questions. Uh, thank you very much for, uh, yeah. uh, who answered them, who asked them. So um, I don't think there's anything specific I would like to highlight. So just uh, make sure that you read uh, questions, not just that you, you asked, but also other attendees because all of them make a lot of sense. Yeah, and thank you so much for answering them and for the help to prepare this. So if there are no further questions, I think we will call it a day. Thank you all so much for attending. Hope that it was useful. Um, yeah, come down and hang out with us on our Slack and, and talk about this. We're very, very interested in, in security. And one final thing, test this stuff. That's It's complicated. So it's pretty easy to make errors. Be paranoid, test everything out. Um, if you have questions, come check in with us and we'd be happy to answer them. With that, have a great day, everybody.
thank you so much and we'll see you soon.